Holy, am I tired today. So to start things off, we're gonna make a quick little G Fuel. I think this is what, this is This is the Bahama Mama one. And dude, it is so good. It's got a little bit of coconut, a little bit of citrus in there. Mmm, delicious. First we get a scoop, dump that bad boy in there. Fill it up with water, shake, give it a, just exploded in my face. Oh my God. It's, she's a squirter. 10% off, co-district. Check it out. Now, today, what we are going to be doing, everyone, is we are going to be talking about Apex ALC controller settings. Um, in case you guys don't know, I'm an Apex coach. I've been coaching since season seven, so over two years, over half of Apex. And I work with two to five people a day um, in Apex. I coach, you know, close to 20 sessions a week. I've coached over a thousand coaching sessions you know over the last two years i've coached thousands of different players and one of the biggest issues that i see with players as they're coming either from call of duty over to apex or as they're switching from apex regular settings to apex alc settings is i notice that people just have no idea what they're changing in the alc settings and even sometimes in the general settings and they're taking what was originally like the default a mediocre okay you know one size kind of fits all type setting and they just absolutely butcher it and they come to me and they go district dude like my aiming sucks like i can't get on target i can't track i can't flick i, I can't switch targets I, I can't do anything bro like what is going on i'm like okay tell me your settings like what's going on they start reading off all the different settings and it is just the most frustrating thing ever knowing that people are changing things without knowing what it's doing and they're just absolutely ruining their game so today what we're going to do is we're going to go over what every single setting does in the ALC settings and help you understand what you should be changing to get the feel that you're looking for. So with that being said, let's hop into the Apex firing range and get cracking, get cracking, get crack lacking. I don't know. Let's go. All right. So we're in the range. And first thing that we're going to do is we're going to hop into our settings. We're going to go over to controller, scroll all the way down to advanced look controls. In here, by default, this would normally be turned off. Just make sure that you turn on your ALCs and that is gonna open up this very daunting, um, very, you know, complex, um, you know, settings chart of various percentages and numbers and, you know, mathematical outbreak um, equations, essentially. A lot of people get really overwhelmed with the ALC settings because there is just so many things that you can change. Don't get overwhelmed. A majority of these settings don't matter that much. And four of the settings, you're really not even going to touch, All right? Now, the three most important settings are going to be your dead zone, your outer thresholds, and your response curve. Everything else, you're gonna kind of use to just fine tune your settings, kind of get your comfortable sense. These three are the most important ones. Um, just before we hop into these settings, we're going to look over here at these two graphs. I want you to understand what these graphs are before we hop into these settings. This first graph here, this is your thumbstick graph. This is a representation almost looking down onto your thumbstick. Okay. The cross here, this is the middle, obviously, and the outside. Well, this is the outside of your thumbstick. This right here is your acceleration chart. The left side of the chart here, you haven't pulled your thumbstick at all. The right side of the chart, you've pulled your thumbstick all the way. Going from bottom to top, this is slow. The top is fast. So as we pull our thumbstick, it's going to get faster and faster. Okay. Now, hopping on into the dead zone. This here is basically how far you need to pull your stick before your thumbstick actually registers in game. If we start pulling our dead zone all the way out, by the way, the default is just always going to be these bars right here, all these little default lines. If you don't see it, then that's because the default is zero, right? But as we see right here, as I start pulling this bar or as I start pulling my um, my settings bar, further and further and further, you'll notice that this blue graph here or this blue line, our dead zone line becomes larger and larger. So if I turn on my controller display and then I go back into the range and I start moving my thumbstick around, you'll notice that I'm moving it quite a bit and it's not registering at all. It's because that dead zone is cranked all the way up, right? This is really bad because now when you're trying to aim, well, I can. I can't get on target because it just doesn't register when I need it to. So overall, your goal is to have as low as a dead zone as possible. That way, 
all of those little micro movements, all of those little micro corrections, they happen right away when you need them to happen the way you need them to happen, right? Go as low as possible. Now I play on 1% dead zone. The way that you're going to find your perfect dead zone is by taking your thumbstick, you're going to bring it all the way out to the edge, and then you're going to let go all the way out to the edge and let go. If your thumbstick can snap back to the middle and it doesn't drift, then you're solid. You're perfect, right? Even if you have a little bit of drift like this, kind of like I, how I do, right? If I just nudge my thumbstick a little bit, it will start drifting because it's not going to naturally come back to center, right? But even with a little bit of drift, that's perfectly fine. You actually, it's sometimes even good to have a little drift because now you know the moment you touch your thumbstick, it's going to input in game. Now, the type of controller that you have is really going to affect your dead zone. I've played with so many different controllers over the years. I used to play exclusively with the Xbox Elite Series 2 controller until I realized that it has really bad input delay and then also the worst stick drift imaginable. Even brand new Elite Series 2 controllers out of the box have ungodly amounts of stick drift versus the controller that I'm currently using right now. Get a little zoom in here. The V2 aim controller with four paddles on the back. It will. This controller right here has no stick drift at all. Extremely little, even on 1%, like right now, no stick drift. So the type of controller that you use also does really matter. My two go-to controllers, if you're looking for a quality premium controller without stick drift, with buttons on the back, is going to be aim controllers as well. Where's the other? Here it is. As well as Cinch gaming controllers. Cinch, they don't have paddles. They have back buttons. I know a lot of people who love back buttons. I think back buttons are pretty good. They are definitely more responsive than paddles, but at the same time, you don't get as much surface area to rest your fingers. So if you got really big, meaty fingers, pa uh, buttons may not be the thing for you. If you got small fingers, buttons may be better for you. But both of them have zero stick drift right out of the box. They're also made by humans and are tested before they get shipped out. Unlike other controllers that you can buy on Amazon, they're just made in a factory, they're sent to you, it's not tested at all. Now, with that being said, you wanna go as low as possible. I play between 1% and 3%. I will never go above 3% because at that point, you're losing too much control over your thumbstick if you wanna be one of the best players in the world and have super refined aim. Now, playing on 0% also isn't the best because every single movement that you do with your thumb, whether it's intentional or not, is going to be registered. So it's even just the tiniest little hair movement with your thumb is going to register in game and that might mess you up. Now, outer threshold. This setting is kind of hard to explain. It pairs very well, or it pairs basically directly with your response curve. You want to use these settings together almost. Now, the outer threshold, as we start moving this graph here, you're going to see that it affects both of these graphs. The outer threshold is almost like the opposite of dead zone. Your dead zone, right, is this blue graph right here. Everything on the inside isn't going to register. Your outer threshold is this orange line. Everything on the outside of this orange line isn't going to register anymore. The outer threshold, oh my, fuck, dude. The outer threshold is essentially the maximum that you can pull your thumbstick before it kind of stops giving you more acceleration, more speed, and more things like that. So, for instance, if we look at the yaw speed, your left, right, and then your pitch, your up, down setting is 290. So, when I reach this orange line with my thumbstick, I'm going to get 290 speed. And then if you have any other settings like extra yaw and extra pitch, that also is going to get added when you hit this orangish yellow line. All right. Now, something else that you'll notice over here on this acceleration graph, the more that I pulled the outer threshold, the more that it's going to get pushed for more and more and more forward and the flatter that the line is going to get or my bad, not the flatter that the line is going to get, but the more dramatic that the line is going to get. So for instance, if we play with a classic response curve, 
the smaller movements that you make with your thumbstick are going to have very minimal reactions in game. As you can see right here, it doesn't accelerate all that much versus the end movements that you make. They're going to accelerate really fast. They're going to kind of ramp up really quickly towards the end. If we start pulling our outer threshold and we move the maximum closer and closer and closer to the middle of your thumbstick, you'll notice that those smaller movements that you make are accelerating a lot quicker. And those medium and large movements that you're making are happening significantly sooner as well. So we can use the outer threshold to amplify our response curve, almost like fine tuning the response curve. I personally like to play on a 4% outer threshold, and then I like to play on a 1% response curve and we'll kind of dive a little bit into that in a little bit here now the response curve is only going to affect this bottom blue graph here and the response curve is how responsive or how sensitive or how dull your stick is going to feel when you're pulling it and you're moving it around so if i have a default here a classic response curve this is you know basically the same in call of duty apex halo pretty much every game uses default classic as their response curve what you'll notice here is that all the small movements you make are going to be very, very small and dull. So if we look at our in game right now and I start moving my thumbstick around, all of the small movements I make with my thumbstick are going to happen very small and refined in game. Versus if I start lowering the response curve, what you'll notice now is that this graph is flattening out. It's becoming linear. It's becoming straight. So all those small movements I make are going to be a lot more responsive to what my thumb is doing, but they're also going to be a lot more twitchier as well. So now when I start moving my thumbstick around, even though I'm moving at the same amount, you're noticing it's moving a lot more. It's super, super responsive. We pull our thumbstick out all the way. All of these small movements, basically nothing's going to happen. All these large movements, a lot is going to happen. Whether that looks like in-game, moving my thumbstick around a lot, nothing's really happening. I move my thumbstick around, around the edges, and it kind of just snaps all over the place. You have very, very little control. So depending on what's comfortable for you and depending on how you want to play, right, you're going to want to adjust your response curve. All right. Now, I used to always play with the 0% response curve. I liked it to be really twitchy. I liked it to be super responsive. But what I was noticing more and more and more, especially as I started to get hand injuries in my thumbs and my thumbs weren't becoming as um, as flexible and, you know, responsive overall as consistent because of my, like I said, my hand injuries, um, I've noticed that I couldn't play on 0% because it was too fast for me. So what I've ended up doing is I've made it a little less responsive. I've increased my response curve so that it's not as twitchy. And then I've increased my outer threshold. So instead of having this, instead of having this slight curve, what I've done is I've made it a little bit more straight by pushing this forward and making those smaller movements happen a little bit sooner. As well, it's making these larger movements move up a little bit and happen also a little bit sooner. Now, this might be really kind of hard to understand, right? But again, just remember your outer threshold is going to amplify your response curve. So everything that happens, it's gonna happen a little bit sooner with your outer threshold. Again, I like to play 1% with a 4%. I'm even considering maybe increasing this to five and then playing with like a 2%, but um, we'll we'll see if we get there. Now, something that's really like dope about PC is that you can use your mouse and you can fine tune this by just like pulling it out ever so slightly. So you can get different versions of 4%. As you can see right here, I can move this around a little bit in 4%. You can't do that on console, sadly. On console, you can only use your D-pad and like move it up by like one or two clicks. On PC, you can move it up as much as you want and you can really, really, really customize this. Now, your per optics is what it sounds like. It is going to be individual settings per individual optic. So for instance, your 1X, your iron sights, you can adjust this. I like to have it on default. That way I have a good base for what I'm gonna be working with. My 2X, 
right? I like to make that 1.2 and every optic I go up by 0.4. Four. You can customize this however you want. I think that my settings are pretty dope. I like this. The reason why I do this, I mentioned it in my whole settings video. If you haven't seen that right here, oh, right here, top right corner of your screen, check that out. The reason why I do that is because there's going to be lots of moments where you have a site, maybe like a 3X, and you find yourself up close like this. I don't want to be limited to only hip firing. I want to be able to look down my site and still be able to move my site around by just using a 1.4 X on the three times. Now, our yaw speeds and pitch speeds. These, This is where things get really, really simple and you don't really need to freak out about these. Your yaw speed is your left and your right speed. Your pitch speed is your up and your down speed. I suggest that you keep these the exact same the reason why is because when you're moving your thumbstick on an angle, oops, when you're moving your thumbstick on an angle like a 45 degree, if the two settings are the exact same, whatever you do on your gamepad, on your controller, it's actually going to happen in game. Versus if you offset these, so like your left and your right is faster than your up and your down, when you try to do a 45 degree angle, it's going to move a little bit more left and right than it is up and down and it's not going to be a true 45 degree angle that you're making with your controller your extra yaw and your extra pitch so your extra left right speed your extra up down speed this is going to be as it says an extra amount of speed whenever you hit this orange line from your response or from your outer threshold. Now I play with 290 and I have 250. So when I reach that outer threshold, it's going to give me a total of 500 speed when I reach the edge. Now ramp up time and ramp up delay, these don't matter that much. I suggest you don't even turn on your delay. And then if you do play with an extra yaw and an extra pitch, having a little bit of ramp up time is useful. Ramp up time is how long it takes for your extra speeds to reach 100%, right? So kind of like the response curve, how it ramps up the more that you pull it, you need to hold your thumbstick on the outside for it to ramp up to your maximum extra yaw and extra pitch, right? So this could be a half second, one second, two seconds, and then it finally hits that 250. I used to play on zero. I noticed that it was inconsistent because sometimes it would just snap and it moved too much, but having that 6% or a 7%, what it does is it gives you a little bit of time to ramp up and then you have extra time to kind of stop it before it hits that full amount and it kind of just gets too crazy. The delay is almost the same as ramp up time, except nothing happens for a certain amount of time. The ramp up time, it slowly ramps up. The delay, it doesn't do anything and then it just happens. So I suggest you don't even have this turned on and you just fine tune your ramp up time. I like a 6% with a maxed out extra yaw. Now this section here, the ADS, all of these settings are the exact same as all of these settings up here. The only difference is that it's ADS, aiming down sight. You're aiming down sight. It's just you looking down the side of your gun like this. So I like to play with a comfortable 125 for my left and right my up and down. And then I also like to add a little bit of extra with my left, right, up, down, and then a little bit of um, ramp up time as well. Now your target compensation, this is just your aim assist. If I'm in the firing range, I turn my aim assist off because it helps me practice a little bit more effectively. Um, but if I'm playing in game, I will more often than not have this turned on unless I'm doing like a challenge or I'm trying to practice in game without aim assist or something like that. But yeah, that right there is ALC settings explained. My general guide for ALC settings is try to find consistent settings, right? So having a lower dead zone, my goal is to play on one to 5% for the average player with their dead zone. The outer threshold, anywhere from two to 5% for their outer threshold response curve anywhere from one to six percent for outer threshold now there's going to be tons of people who like to play on classic there's tons of pros who play on classic the only reason why i think that a lower response curve is better is because it is more responsive and it's more likely to do what you want it to actually 
do, right? Because this curve here means that the smaller movements you make aren't going to happen right away and they're not going to be as responsive as you might like. You, you might have to pull your stick a lot more than what you're thinking you're going to have to do. And you're just going to feel like it's just feeling too slow and too stiff. A lot of people will be like, oh man, my settings are so slow. And then they turn up their speed. But really all they need to do is they need to make those smaller movements a little bit more responsive by turning this down a little bit. Right, so I think 5% is super comfortable for a majority of the player base. If you want to go, you know, above and beyond and have a super responsive controller, which I wouldn't suggest if you don't have a good high-end controller, because it might be too responsive at that point. Go with around 1%. Now that's everything for today. If you guys have any questions about your settings or about what you should be playing on, leave it in the comment section down below. I'll do the best that I can to get back to everyone. Obviously, if you're watching this years into the future, I'm probably not going to answer, but you never know. Maybe I will. Love to help you guys out. If you guys ever want to book a coaching session with me, consider doing that. The link is in the description down below. Coaching starts at $25 a session. Pretty affordable. And we also have budget group coaching sessions, 20% off, as well as we have monthly and weekly classes starting off at $7.50. Imagine getting four hours of coaching for $7.50. Cheeseburgers cost more than that, bro. Keep that in mind. That's all for today. Love you guys so much, and we'll see you all in the next one. Keep bettering yourself, guys. I know you can do it.